the power of performance group. This is David McMahon. I welcome, welcome Kevin White from Acellos as the moderator of today's conversation. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, David. Um, hello, I'm Kevin White, and I'm a business solutions advisor at Excellus. And I'm proud to have two longtime Excellus Performance Group members and consulting clients with me today, as well as David McMahon from Excellus. We have Paul Sherman, who has been a member of our Kaizen Group since 2010. He is the CEO of Sherman's Furniture in Peoria. Next, we have Brian Garrison, owner of Garrison's Home Furnishings in Medford, Oregon. He's been a member since 2011. Uh, David McMahon is Director of Excellus Performance Groups and Management Consulting. He co-directs Paul's and Brian's Kaizen Group with Wayne McMahon and leads the Visionary Group. The purpose of today's webinar is to give you valuable information on how performance groups improve the business of its members. We also are going to share with you what some of the best businesses in the industry are doing now. Finally, at the end of the webinar, we have an exciting announcement to make. We will have a separate question period at the end of the webinar where any of you can ask questions um, on any, to anyone on the call. Uh, so please use the question control panel. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about your business? Yeah, you bet, Kevin. We, uh, Sherman's is located in central Illinois, uh, based in Peoria, Illinois. We have three stores uh, in three different marketplaces. Uh, we are in the appliance, electronics, furniture, and mattress uh, businesses. We're about a $30 million retailer, um, kind of just to give you an idea who we are there. Okay, uh, thanks, Paul. And can you tell us a little bit about the members in your group and who they are? Sure, sure. Yeah, we have uh, a number of different members kind of all over the, the country and uh, uh, one outside. Um, folks up uh, in uh, New England, Brown Furniture. Uh, Crown Furniture is a company down in Aruba that's part of it. Um, have the guys from four states uh, down in Texarkana. Have some Ashley stores as well as furniture stores. Uh, Brian, you know, who's who is uh, with us here as well. Um, I could, I could kind of go down the list. I guess we've got uh, a number of other uh, dealers that uh, go anywhere from across the country, up one up in Alaska, uh, and everybody's either you know everybody's a profit user, and everybody's in furniture in one way or another. Some of us carry appliances, some of us don't. Uh, but enough similarities anyway to make the group a pretty dynamic thing. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, Brian, can you tell us a little bit about your business? Yeah, we. Uh, I'm I'm Brian Garrison of Garrison's Home Furnishings and Garrison's Mattress Gallery. We're located in Medford, Oregon, which is the very southern end of Oregon. Uh, we're a full line furniture and mattress store. Um, initially, when we opened in 2007, we were kind of a a mid-end to mid to low-end, uh, but as the years have progressed, we've kind of turned into a mid to high-end. Uh, we have about 22,000 square feet of furniture showroom. Back in 2012, we opened up a 5,000 square foot mattress gallery, so we took all the mattresses out of the furniture side, moved it to a building, a detached building, basically right next door, and opened up Garrison's Mattress Gallery to really be in the mattress business as well. And then on site, we have about a 12,000 square foot distribution center. Um, started out as about a $2 million operation. Our first year out of the gate this year, we're trending to be about a $7 million uh, operation. Uh, currently have about 26 employees to give everybody an idea of our size and our business model. OK. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Brian. Um, now, David, can you tell us what you do? Sure. Well, I've been a uh, business uh, operational and financial consultant for around 15 years. Uh, four years ago, I also became a director of our CEO performance groups. In a nutshell, I help businesses uh, improve and become better. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And can you describe what an Excellos performance group is? Yeah, sure. Fellows performance groups are each made up of approximately 10 dedicated companies. They share the same desires to help each other improve. In doing so, they become better businesses, and they generally uh, are ahead of their competitors, and, and they beat them in many cases, and they become more profitable as a result. Okay, and uh, what exactly is your role? 
my role in the uh, within within the group is uh, to act as a facilitator and a uh, uh, and an organizer and a content deliverer. So, uh, because of my experiences in the field uh, and Wayne's experience, we're able to uh, to uh, bring firsthand knowledge to help the group with uh, various ideas to improve themselves and to direct them in the in, in the right fashion. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, so, Paul, you've been a member of Excel's performance groups for several years. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience there? Sure. Sure. Yeah. It. Um, you know, uh, David kind of kind of hit on it there a little bit in terms of the group is uh, you know all the members are there to help each other. Um, and I don't know, a lot of folks probably have had experience with some other kind of an industry group. Uh, like our biggest one is an appliance buying group. And you do compare some best practices and you try to help each other a little bit at that type of an event. But this performance group is, is kind of unlike anything else I've, I've ever done. Um, it's not people posturing. It's not people busy doing other things. We get together and we've developed a trust level where everybody in this group their sole reason for being there is to improve their own businesses and then give back to the other members and help them improve their other their businesses. Uh, there are no other motivations for that. That's the entire trip. Um, well, except for maybe having a little fun. But as far as the business side of it, it's purely just just improving our own businesses. And you can't. Uh, I, there's no BS in this group because we're all bearing our financials and our. We have to uh, it's kind of a peer pressure group end of the group, you sign off on goals, you present the next time whether or not you did them. So you, uh, you, you both, I guess, feel a little pressure from your, your friends uh, to, to implement the things that you say you're going to implement, as well as you know all these other people, these ideas they're sharing with you, they're only doing it because they want to help you, only because they've actually seen them work. So it just becomes a really great dynamic, uh, a great kind of think tank when you want to step outside your business for a few days and get some some new fresh perspectives on where you should be going. So it uh, it's been great for us. Great. Well, uh, thanks for sharing, Paul. Uh, Brian, how about your experience? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the same things. I remember back in 2011 when uh, when going into the first meeting, I was I was pretty darn nervous. You know, um, the store was growing, very successful, grew by 35 percent, I think it was in 2010, but. I still kind of felt like I didn't know enough about the industry to really be able to contribute. I kind of felt like I was going to just go there and uh, and soak up all this knowledge and not really, you know, not really be in a position to to contribute and help uh, other people out. Um, and I think a lot of people, maybe even listening to this webinar that have been approached by these, probably have those same concerns. Uh, from my experience, you know, even that very first meeting, I was surprised uh, not at the information I, I received from the from the meeting because I, I pretty much knew I was going to go there and I was going to learn some cool stuff. Um, I was actually surprised that I was able to help out a lot more than I thought I was going to be able to. And, and when, when we're all in this industry, there's things that we learn that sometimes I think we don't even realize that, that we learn and that we've done as a business um, that somebody else sitting across from you is maybe stumbling upon something that, that you would actually figure out a way to, to solve and, and, and made a tweak in your business to make it a little bit better based upon um, obviously that challenge that they're having. Um, so I was actually able, I was, I was pleasantly surprised, I was able to help some people out in that, that first inaugural meeting just based upon experiences that, that we had had and challenges that we had overcome. Um, and on the flip side of that, you know, when people would come up with, with challenges that they had and they were thinking about solving them in this way, you know, I had actually tried a couple of that of those things that they were saying they were going to try and, and failed epically at, at executing. So the power, believe it or not, isn't always in the best practice and what you're able to execute. A lot of times you've had an experience or somebody else has an experience that, hey, do not do this. It just doesn't work. So you're just able to share those insights and, and, bounce, uh, and bounce those ideas off one another. Um, from there, pretty much every meeting, I've really gained a better understanding of, of my business, of the industry as a whole, of ways to obviously improve what we're doing. And and it's completely backed with profitability numbers. I mean, I look at the substantial growth that we've had, top line and bottom line, since I started on these meetings. 
and I can directly relate a ton of that to just the information that, that we've gotten. It, it's these meetings really, you know, as owners, we get trapped uh, in in blinders on when you work in business day to day. So it's really become my opportunity twice a year to kind of see the forest from the trees and and to recharge my batteries and get energized to, to come back and implement some new fun things that are gonna just help us become that much better. Great, well thank you so much for sharing, Brian. I appreciate that. Um, so I'll redirect this to David. Um, how do you think performance groups benefit their members? Well, I think uh, Paul and Brian uh, hit the nail on the head there. Uh, these are really peer business groups. The members, they develop a camaraderie and act as a sort of external uh, board of directors. Uh, anytime you get 20 smart, motivated, and experienced people in the same room, some good things happen. Thanks, Kevin. Definitely. Okay, well thanks so much, David. Um, Paul, can you tell us about some of the trips that you've been on and some of the things you've seen on with the Excellus Performance Groups? Yeah, sure. We, um, so each of our meetings, we meet twice a year. Uh, and we always do it at a dealer's uh, hometown. Uh, we, we visit that particular dealer. So we started off critiquing that dealer, uh, and that's kind of the whole purpose of, of visiting you know, that particular town. So we end up going to wherever the stores are. Um, and in addition to, uh, so you know, we, we've been everywhere from uh, you know, Medford, Oregon, to, to see Brian, um, uh, like I say, out in New England, uh, a couple places in Texas, uh, uh, going to uh, Alaska next month um, to see the Merrills. I've uh, been down to Aruba, have uh, Crown Forest's store down in uh, Aruba. And depending on where you're going, we will often, you know, this has become, we get, it's very business oriented, but on the other hand, um, you develop such a trust level and friendship with a lot of the members that we'll often mix a little bit of vacation in there with that too. Uh, for instance, you know, next month, uh, my family's coming out with me uh, a week ahead of time. Uh, spending some time both on our own with some other members uh, ahead of the meeting, and it makes it just makes it kind of a, a lot of fun, uh, kind of mixing the both the business and the pleasure side up to it. So it's they're always enjoyable trips, that's for sure. Yeah, it definitely sounds uh, like it's a lot of fun. Isn't it a lot of expense? How is it worth it? Um, it's additional expense. Uh, whether you look at the time uh, or the dollars in travel. It is the from the very first meeting I went to, and uh, you know somebody asked me about how, how you approach this kind of a thing, holding managers responsible. I had no answer. They explained how they handle it. Like that's the smartest thing I've ever heard, and I can't believe I'm not doing that. Go back, implement it, and paid for the trip several times over. So on a very unproductive trip. Uh, I get enough to pay for the trip once or twice over. On a very productive trip, you make enough business prove, you know, improvements to pay for it 100 times over. So it, you always get something out of it that makes it far more, far worth, very worthwhile for both your time and your dollars. There's just no doubt about it. Gotcha. Well, thanks so much for sharing, Paul. Uh, Brian, how about you? What are some of your favorite memories? Um, yeah, as far as memories go, there's it's hard to pinpoint just one. Um, obviously, having an Aruban member that has an operation in Aruba is, is is pretty awesome. Getting to go to to the island and experience that, not only from just obviously being in paradise in Aruba, but kind of seeing how a different operation in a different country runs their business, and you're shocked at how many parallels there are, even when you're outside of of your own country in a different business model. So. Um, honestly, though, for me, the, it's probably the best part of the groups is, is really the camaraderie that we've formed in, in this group in particular. I, I generally care about every member, and, and I look forward to seeing them. Um, you know, I've even taken trips outside of the meeting with these guys. In fact, uh, I took my two main leaders uh, out to Peoria um, to, to see Paul's operation, um, completely outside of the meetings, and, and to kind of learn some of the things he's implemented. And on the flip side, I was able to help Paul, um, you know, with some sales training with his leading guys on adjustable, adjustable base selling strategies. So it was kind of a mutual uh, benefit thing there, and got to spend some time with Paul and his family. So um, you know, those relationships, I mean, it's it's just it's amazing. And then 
hosting, I got the pleasure last summer of actually hosting the meeting for the first time here in Medford. And the power of having 10 great retailers walk through my store and, and help me improve, uh, it, you just you can't put uh, an expense price tag on that. I mean, it's it, it was absolutely unbelievable. Um, and then you get the pleasure of showing off your hometown, you know, your community to to people that haven't got to experience it. So, you know, that was amazing too. So you have all you have this mix of just obviously absolutely phenomenal business ideas and business improvements. Um, and that's at the core of it. That's what we're there for. You're there to work hard and figure some stuff out and improve your business, you know, the byproduct of that is building great relationships with great retailers that you can lean on outside of these meetings um, and and really just have a good time and, and separate for, for a few days. Okay, great. I think that's that, awesome. Uh, if I could just interject one other thing there, too. It's telling, too, that in the 30 minutes prior to this webinar, um, I spoke to one other profit member and communicated by email with another about another issue we're all working on, uh, just regarding floor displays and balance. And you know, Brian hit on that. We it's not just the meetings. Whenever we have a question and we want advice uh, or different perspectives on something that we from somebody we totally trust, we shoot stuff around all the time and compare. Hey, what would you do about this? What are you doing here? What do you think is that is good for that? Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal group for that for that reason as well. Great. Well, thanks so much for sharing, Paul. Um, kind of along the same line, while we're talking about meetings, uh, David, can you tell us a little bit about um, you know what a typical meeting looks like? What exactly takes place in Excellus Performance Group? Sure. Yeah. We, uh, as Paul mentioned, uh, we travel to a, a new location uh, twice per year. Most often, we visit a member's operation, but it's not required. The, uh, the members decide together uh, where they would like to go. Uh, we provide insight uh, into the location that we're going to and how they can improve. We also learn from what they are doing well. Uh, everybody in the group, including uh, myself and Wayne, uh, bring best practices to the table. Um, so everyone walks away with many new ideas. Okay, We also... Uh, compare KPIs, key performance indicators, and examine where each other uh, needs improvement and what specifically to do. Uh, goal setting and accomplishment uh, is also, uh, it forms a key uh, part of the meetings. Uh, we hold each other um, accountable as well as helping each other. Um, there's no hard and fast rules, actually. You know, some of the best conversations and ideas come off agenda. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, David. And Brian, how do you find this format? Oh, I love it. Um, you know, D David and Wayne do a, a great job kind of letting the members dictate the flows of the meeting. But at the same, in the same respect, they don't let us get too off track so we can stick to the agenda because obviously there are certain things that we need to cover. Um, why we're there for those for those two and a half, three days. Um, the most powerful information that I've gotten in a lot of these meetings is, often, is oftentimes just a tangent that the group has gone off on. You know, we start talking about one topic and then all of a sudden, before we know, that's morphing into this, this major topic that wasn't even on the agenda but is, is an absolute must that we discuss this. And, and rather than, you know, rather than dictating, hey guys, no, we need to keep to the agenda, the, the facilitators do a phenomenal job letting us have those conversations and, and go off on those tangents because obviously there's a lot of power in that. We're really addressing things that, that need to be addressed. Uh, the other great thing that we do that wasn't mentioned is every night you know we have a, a dinner together, um, and yeah, that's fun. But again, a lot of the a lot of the biggest ideas that I've implemented in my business have actually just come from a private conversation I've had with one of the members uh, in fellowship at, at, at dinner. So. Um, a lot more than just the meetings itself, just you know, the social interaction for, for those days is, is amazing. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, going over to Paul, yeah, I know you've been a member for a long time. Does this format work for you? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it is. We've, you know, we've, as a group, we have talked about it quite a bit, and uh, uh, David and Wayne have, have always asked us what we want the format to be, and we have tweaked it a little bit here and there to, to make sure it works. But you know, to me, there's a lot of different things we'll do at different meetings. If we want to hear about a particular topic, 
uh, and David might do some research, do a presentation for us on it, something like that, even bring in a speaker or an expert. Those, those are great. But we never really stray. There's four real, real keys to it. Number one, there's that store critique of that member who gets a ton of benefit out of that. We all do view in it. Um, the best practices consumes a lot of the time. Uh, we, we each bring something that's really been working for us, and uh, you always end up leaving with something that, that you also want to do. Um, the third one is a financial metric comparison. Uh, we all put our financials together, uh, KPIs, etc., and share them. Uh, it's powerful because not only do you get to see what other people are doing, so you see somebody, it's like, wow, that really is possible. I just told my people that wasn't possible. Look, he's doing it. You, know, you get real good information, and you also know you have to you have to show up at the next meeting and show yours. So it, it's kind of, let's say, that peer pressure thing. Um, and then lastly, also along the peer pressure side, is uh, we decide on goals and then present the next time and whether we've done them. So those kind of four key things as a part of every single meeting uh, give you a very consistent format to structure, uh, structure the meeting. Uh, and then all the other little things that, that fit in provide a ton of value as well. It's a good format. Great. Okay. Thanks for thanks for sharing, Paul. So, um, you know, it seems like we all know the reason you guys do this. It makes your business better and it makes your money, right? Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a couple of practices that you got from Excellus performance groups that you've used in your business and what effect they've had? Uh, Brian, if you could go first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I spent some time thinking thinking about uh, the two that I wanted to share. Um, one I want to share was somewhat of a complex one. It, uh, we implemented, and this was actually Paul's best practice a, a few years ago, a perfect delivery system where basically we created an incentive package for our warehouse and delivery team based upon how effectively they do their job. Now there's, there's six or seven um, you know, key metrics that, that we look at and we measure. Um, to do this, so I can't. It's too hard to go into too much depth at it. But you know, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of implementation. It took um, a lot of thought using some of the spreadsheets that that Paul was kind enough to share with us when he implemented this. But the end result was we were actually able to shave a point off our delivery warehouse expense directly related to these changes that we made, and along those lines, also increase uh, the level of customer service that that our warehouse and delivery team was providing. So. A uh, phenomenal idea that Paul implemented. Uh, we did a lot of what Paul did, and obviously you, every store is going to kind of morph it to what works for their operation. Um, but this particular one was it was pretty in depth and, and and took a lot of time to execute. The next one I'll share was a, a pretty darn simple one. Um, Boris, the Aruban dealer, talked about how he started implementing one on one meetings with all his leadership team once a month, and once a month he would close the door and. Basically, just have a, a brief conversation about, okay, what, what's going good, what's going bad, here's what we need to improve on, here's what we talked about last month, how are we doing? And so instead of these formal reviews that just never seem to happen, just a basic conversation with, with your employees once a month kind of solves that. And he, he ended up doing that down the line. I think Boris has uh, you know, over 100 employees, so every department head is, is responsible for having these monthly one-on-ones with um, with with every one of their employees and kind of like one of those why the heck weren't we doing that you know the, there's so much power in just a simple conversation with somebody um, so we've implemented it and we've actually seen a significant decrease in employee issues and turnover um, morale is better and the amount of information we get you get from when you have these conversations and your leaders are having these conversations with your frontline employees I mean, those are the people that really know what some of the major issues are, and this is this is an avenue for them to to tell you, hey, we could really stand by improving this. So we've seen some some really game changing ideas since we implemented that, and it was such a simple best practice that we were able to implement. And I know Paul's implemented it too, so Paul, hopefully, I didn't steal your thunder when you talk about some of yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's actually who's next. Um, I was going to ask Paul, you know, what are a couple of the practices that you've implemented and what were the results? And thanks for sharing, Brian. Yeah, but, I will agree one on one. That was a phenomenal idea. That, that's one of those that was so, I was struggling with, you know, how to do reviews. I heard that and it's like, well, that's so, that's so simple. Why did I think of that? And some of the best ideas, you know, you get that. So um, a couple of the things, uh, at, when we hosted the meeting, uh, I remember everybody was uh, walking around the store, um, interviewing you know all of our folks, trying to discover things about our business, and uh, you know I felt like I was being 
sat down by my teachers or something, but they, it's like what you know what I, we see all these people running around. Doesn't look like you're getting everybody. Uh, I've got, I see you've got these sales metrics and these metrics and this metrics. You know what's your door count? What what's your how many people per hour are your salespeople helping? And I just kind of had to say, well, I don't know. I don't have a door counter. It just never I, I don't know. Didn't occur to me. Um, and of course, I get chastised for that and don't know the metrics. So the next thing we do is install good door counters. And you start really looking at your traffic by hour and how you're staffed. Uh, and it was very, very obvious to us once we started collecting that data how many sales we were missing because we're pretty, it's not, a, it's not like a slow furniture store. It's a, very, it's a faster plant electronic kind of pace. Um, by using that data, we, we both staffed properly. We brought the, the metrics down to sales per guest based on real true door count data, not just reported opportunities. And that entire system, which probably took us 18 months to really get into place, literally literally improved our closing ratio by two and a half to three percent. Um, if anybody if you, any of you do your own math on that, that uh, is one of those things paid for that meeting a uh, hundred or five hundred times over. Um, another more recent one, uh, was just uh, sitting with one of our Paul Wilson, one of our, our group members at lunch, uh, talking about our struggle with customer surveys. Uh, he mentioned, oh, hey, you know what Ashley's pushing is this uh, Ultimate Question 2.0, the book that he recommended I read. And it's your changing your survey system to an extremely simple two-answer two question. Uh, one is on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to recommend Sherman's to your friends and family? And number two is why. And this may sound really simple, but we implemented this uh, in our company. And we now have a system where everybody gets surveyed. Every, cus every person instantaneously gets feedback on what their customers are saying about them. And it gives us metrics to be able to let everybody see what's really most important to the customer. And it's been transformative in terms of turning everybody's attitude towards that customer service. Um, so anyway, those are those are kind of two ideas that both never would have been implemented in our business, I don't think, if it hadn't been for groups that have made a, a tremendous difference in, in who we are. Uh, it's a long list. Those are two examples. Got it. Well, thanks so much for sharing, Paul. Um, okay, Ryan, uh, what is one practice that you brought to the table? Um, to be honest, I'm really, really excited about this upcoming meeting because uh, we, we've been able to implement something that's been, been pretty game-changing to us. and. Uh, I won't go too. I won't go into that. But my best practice from last year, um, I was pretty proud of. Um, we came up with basically a what is our lineup like? What what in our showroom? What are program pieces that are absolutely nailed to the floor? Um, we put that all on spreadsheets and based on, uh, based on category and then price point to to really take a look at. Okay, well, all of a sudden we realize, well, why do we have you know? Eight sofas at $9.99 and no options at $10.99 or $11.99 or $12.99. Um, so we're able to come up with this this great, just relatively simple spreadsheet system. And then on top of that, we created a catalog based upon that. So now anytime a new salesperson comes aboard, um, they're basically given Garrison's catalog. And it's kind of an internal thing. You don't we don't show it to customers, but it basically has pictures of of everything that's on our lineup and the price point. So now our new salespeople or even our existing salespeople can kind of go to that and remind themselves, hey, when you're doing this presentation and someone's looking at this bedroom set, um, you know where to go as a step up and as a step down to take them and show them different options. And you're, you're not tied into just having too many, too many floor slots that are dedicated to one price point and know where to go to take a customer to the next best price point to increase your average ticket. Great. Okay, well, thanks for sharing, Brian. Uh, how about you, Paul? I know you've contributed quite a bit um, over the years to the group. Um, what's one practice that you brought? You know, again, quite a few. Uh, you know, bring something to every meeting. Um, probably the the most impactful one uh, was uh, Brian touched on it for a moment there. I'm going to go. In, I'll go into a little more detail. Is what has come to kind of be known: perfect sales, perfect delivery, or, or perfect programs. I guess. Um, what we did was it started in sales and it moved throughout our company uh, is a system where you, you, you force yourself to decide that for any given individual, what are the three most important things they do that if they do that, uh, you're going to say they're doing a great job. You know, in sales, uh, we decide it's selling enough stuff 
uh, selling the right stuff is in high gross margin product and selling the stuff that goes with it, all the attachments. So you, you pick those three things, uh, then you make sure they're measurable and you set goals for each person each week and attach dollars to those goals. Uh, you give them a you know, 13 or 26 week period and then pay those out. You make it a public game so people write their own scores every week on a scoreboard. It's a system that you can apply to so many. We apply it to our delivery guys. We apply it to the sales guys, customer service. And it simply it clarifies your expectations. It makes, public, it makes people's performance public. Um, so you, you have that uh, uh, accountability. Uh, it rewards the, the right people for doing it. They've been tremendous programs that have become a core who we, what we've done, and then many of our group members have, have implemented them. Um, so that's probably one of the ones that's been most most widely adopted. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us, Paul. I appreciate that. Um, David, you see a lot of companies as a profitability consultant. How are those who are in the group who are group members different from businesses who are not? Yeah. Well, generally, group members are have an extra level of motivation to work consistently over time on their business. Uh, they're, they're open type of people to sharing uh, ideas, just as you've seen uh, today with uh, Paul and Brian. They give, uh, they, they give, and then thus they get back. Bottom line, the average profitability of a group member exceeds the industry by, I would say, 3 to 6% net income bottom line in my opinion. And it's huge dollars. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, David. Uh, Brian, Paul, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it, you, you've got to want to improve your business to, to, to do this in the first place. And then when you're there, you have no choice but to, to focus on your business. And you want to do good presentations because you want to give back to the other group members. So it's just, yeah, it's I, mean, I agree 100%. It's uh, we're we are a more profitable business because of these groups um, by by at least three three points. I I would think that's a very very easy easy number to get to. Let me it may maybe be helped to explain this by explaining what makes a bad group member. <laughs> um, if <laughs> if you're the type of person who um, comes to comes to the meeting wants to brag about a few things you've done, not really listen and then come back and explain, give excuses why you did nothing, um, <laughs> that's a bad group member. They're not going to get anything out of it nor contribute to anybody in the group. Uh, the, the, the people who we tend to attract and retain within the group uh, is exactly what you've said. People who do not think they know it all, uh, usually they're incredibly smart, but just don't, you know, aren't willing to just always say, I have all the answers. Uh, and don't mind pulling the trigger, going trying stuff, doing something new, seeing what happens, not being too afraid to fail. Um, if you're that kind of a person, if you run your business in that fashion, you'll eat groups up. It is, it is a uh, uh, you, you'll leave fired up and have all kinds of new ideas for things. So that's that's the kind of business owner, in my opinion, that uh, really would benefit from it and, and kind of why it, why it makes it work the way it does. Great. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, so, David, let's talk a little bit about what is next for Excellus Performance Groups. Where are the next meetings? Well, Brian and uh, Paul's uh, Kaizen group uh, is meeting in Alaska, um, and we're visiting uh, Tree Farms Furniture, and they have a new mattress cali. That's uh, July uh, 20 to 23. Uh, our, our visionary group is um, who has uh, 10 members as well, um, our meeting in uh, Lincoln, uh, Nebraska, uh, at, and we're visiting uh, Lincoln Furniture and Mattress, and that is September 22, uh, oh, 23 to 25. And Great. We have, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So we have a uh, the the announcement uh, that, that that we have out right now is that we are uh, forming a, uh, a new Acellos performance group, okay? And it's going to be in San Diego at the uh, uh, beginning of November of this year. Well, that's definitely exciting news, David. Um, um, I just wanted to uh, take a minute and 
uh, thank Brian and Paul for attending the webinar. Um, you both have been so successful. Um, uh, Brian, I wanted to ask, where do you see your business and uh, the industry in general going? Hopefully, our business continues to grow at the at the pace that it's uh, that it's been growing. You know, it's been a lot of fun uh, going to these meetings and and implementing new systems, um, cultivating employees, and ultimately making customers happy, which all flows to to your bottom line. You know, when I started in these meetings and I go to them and I'd come back, uh, I remember initially there was almost like, oh great, here here Brian comes, we're going to try all sorts of new stuff, and it was almost. Uh, it was almost, you know, a point of contention with the employees, and now it's pretty much like, Brian, go. I can't wait till you come back because they've seen the results of, of all these things. So, you know, I, I'm just hoping that, that we can continue. We've, we've, we've seen some substantial growth over the last uh, last three years, and and this year is uh, is no exception to that. We're, we're continuing to grow. So um, hopefully that can be there. The, the industry as a general, you know, I think – um, I think hopefully we'll continue to get better. I'm hearing a lot of this, the same things I'm talking about in terms of improvement with a lot of businesses that I talk to in the industry. Um, it was something we, we touched on in the last meeting. I think it really just all comes down at this point to, to exceptional customer service. Um, obviously, you know, we spend money on the back end and, and on systems and everything, but we really we really hit on this last time. It's, it's really about your customer's experience, and, and we're starting to spend more money on taking care of our customers and less on advertising. And the main reason is is based upon the conversation we had last meeting where you take me for example. Um, I I listen to, to satellite radio when I drive into work. So if you're running a radio commercial, which we do, you're you're not gonna hear me there. I pretty much D V R all the all the T V shows that uh, that I'm gonna watch and I fast forward through the commercials. I think a large part of the public is doing that now. So television commercials are less effective. So how are you truly reaching the customers out there? And for me and personally, where do I go when I'm gonna make a purchase decision? Well I read online reviews and I talk to friends and family. So um, we've really kind of taken the stance we're pulling back on advertising a little bit and we're really killing with customer service and encouraging positive customer reviews and five star ratings on, on the websites and We've seen a substantial increase in business and obviously a decrease in our advertising expense. So um, I see that as kind of where the industry seems to be going. People want to do business with good companies that have good reputations, and, and I think reputation marketing is, is kind of where, where I see the industry going. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, for sharing and attending the webinar, Brian. Um, you've been very successful, and uh, we're very excited to, uh, to see that success influencing your business. I think that's great. So thank you again. Uh, for, for joining. Um, I'll switch over to Paul. Um, yeah, Paul, again, you know, you're one of the most respected leaders in the industry, and I wanted to thank you as well for attending. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what is your prediction for the future of your business and the industry as well? Well, on those two things, uh, I guess our own business uh, also, uh, things have been going very well for us. We're of our main store is our combination store distribution center. Um, we're shopping for a new distribution center right now to expand. We've, we've outgrown the present one. We'll be using that space to double our main showroom in size to um, add, well, just expand everything. Um, had some changes in our marketplace here and really an opportunity to, uh, to grow quite a bit. So we're going to be, over the next 12 to 18 months, investing more than we, we have in the business ever. Uh, so things are looking positive from uh, that side of things. Plenty to do, of course. But, uh, you know, on the industry side, um, that's funny, Brian. We, Brian and I didn't talk before this, so it's funny that I had nearly the same thing to talk about he did. And it, it's, uh, I guess my advice would be, you know, you don't really know what's coming in terms of the economy or that sort of thing. But there are definite societal trends that you can pay attention to. And if... If your way of going to market is, uh, you know, advertising sales and trying to keep coming up with more and more creative promotions and more frequent ones, um, it, it's uh, it's something that's not going to work long term. Uh, you've already seen if you do that that you have to create more incredible offers and the effectiveness of your ad dollars is less and less. Today, you know, your credibility is is what it's all about. People have really great BS meters. They, they know when something's legitimate and when it's not. Um, that's been kind of the focus between our uh, focus on the on Net Promoter Score, which is that survey I was talking about. And it really is very much up the lines of what Brian was talking about. 
we pay attention to referral business, uh, where people you know say we should shop, or what our own past experiences are in it. So most anybody, whether it's within this group or other really progressive retailers I know, are doing the same thing in if they're going to continue a heavy advertising budget, they're going to do it by defining clearly who they are. It is most, most of it's been on branding, not promotions, telling people why you should shop at Sherman's, not necessarily because of sale, but because of other advantages. And secondly, investing every dollar you can in phenomenal customer service, uh, customer retention, generating referrals, and just literally creating a better experience for, for your customer. It might sound a little cliche, but it, it's, uh, it, it deserves investment because uh, we, we're certainly banking on it as the future where we're going. So at, uh, I think that's probably one of the most important industry trends we're seeing. Great. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for attending, Paul. We appreciate your feedback. Now's the time for any questions. Uh, David, what questions have you received? Okay, if, uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, on your uh, GoToWebinar panel, there's a, uh, an area where you can expand the question uh, spot and type it in. I have received a uh, couple questions. The, uh, the first one um, uh, is uh, tell us about the uh, September uh, meeting in San Diego. Um, all right, well, this is a new Acellos Performance Group. It's uh, open industry-wide. We are uh, going to uh, seek to have 10 new company members. It's going to follow the same successful format as uh, Brian and Paul's Kaizen Group um, and our visionary group. And uh, those on this webinar are uh, going to be the uh, first to, uh, to apply if they wish, um, for this uh, this meeting and this group. Um, if you're interested in that, you can contact uh, me via email or uh, phone, and we can, we can talk about your business. Uh, OK, here's another question. This one, it looks like it's directed at uh, Brian and Paul. Um, how have employees handled changes that you brought back from your meetings? Who wants to go first? Uh, I could address that. Um, the that has changed a lot as time has gone on. Um, you know, the first changes we brought, whether you go back to maybe I should go back a year or so before we went into profit in the profit groups when we actually installed profit, uh, were what would be the proper word. Um, mutiny would probably be the proper word. <laughs> when you try to change up people's commission system, you go to variable commission instead of uh, straight commission, things along this line. Um, you know, oh, we're going to be barcoding products? You mean I have to scan it? What? When I move it, I have to do that? It, it, it's an incredible, incredible resistance. Um, the only way we got through it is you... You, you explain, yes, I know it's a, it's a change. It, it may be a pain. You may not like it. Here's why we're doing it. You're going to like our company better when we get this done. And over the years, when we bring something to the table now, people are very receptive to it because they know that we do a pretty damn good job. We're proud of our company. And people like to be a part of that. Um, but I'm not going to pretend that was easy. That was a multi-year process of bringing things to the table getting resistance, then people looking back saying, ah, that wasn't too bad an idea. That worked pretty good. I'll be less resistant this time to today where it's kind of like, what are we doing now? Hey, guys, how come we're not doing something new? So it's definitely a, a culture thing that has to be uh, cultivated over time. Yeah, I would, I would agree with our experience is pretty much exactly what Paul's experience. You know, the first couple of meetings, uh, a lot of resistance to change. I mean, change is, is especially to your frontline employees, it, it's a scary thing. I mean, it's a scary thing sometimes for, for us as owners. Um, but if you execute these changes and you stick to them and you're able to show improvements, which you will if you stick to them, then over time you gain your employees' trust and we're kind of in the same boat. It, it's pretty much now, like I said earlier, it's almost like they can't wait for the next meeting because they know something cool is probably going to come out of it on the back end that's going to make this a more fun place to work. And you know, everyone everyone that is employed by us now 
really believes in the future of this business and believes that we're we try to be on the cutting edge and we try to do everything we can to improve in the business and and they're they're proud to to wear a shirt that says Garrison's because of that reason. Um, so you know the changes, yeah, it, 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 people are going to be are going to be afraid to change at first, but if you if you prove to them that these changes are going to have a positive impact on their work environment, that that trust um, that trust is going to be gained in in not too long of a time. Thanks, Brian and Paul. Um, two more questions I'll take, and I have two of them here. The first, it says, uh, somebody says, do you have a group that represents smaller companies? Example, two to four million dollars. Well, I'll, I'll give my brief answer and then pass it over to whoever wants to comment. But uh, our members range from one million to 50 million. And we have members from the small size to the large size in the same group. And I, I will, uh, and the other thing is, do you always want to be two to four million? I don't think Brian was the same size when he joined, but w Paul, Brian, what do you, um, what do you think about that question about the size of the company in a group? I, I personally, I mean, our, our our group ranges from Paul, which Paul's about thirty million, to uh, I think our smallest is about two to three million, um, and there is just as much information, and I think Paul would attest to this, that he gets from, you know, the, the two to three million dollar store that he can apply to, to his thirty million dollar operation as the two to million two million dollar store can get from Paul as a thirty million dollar operation. There are tons of parallels in this business. At the end of the day, we're all kind of doing the same thing. And some of the problems that Paul's been able to solve absolutely apply to me and some of the problems I've been able to solve absolutely apply to Paul. That's true. There are a lot of similarities. Um, the dissimilarities can be just as advantageous, though, because there have been situations where, you know, I'll be talking to a dealer that's doing three million uh, about something, and their comment would be, "Well, you know what? Uh, you've lost touch with this. You're not as close to the customer as I am. So you need to think about this over here. You ain't thinking about that right in your office. That's really helped me out." I can sometimes help a smaller dealer saying, you know what, as you grow, here's a problem you're going to run into that you're not thinking of right now because I never would have thought of it until I had to have an HR department or I had to have this, you know. Um, so the, 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 similar, the, the, the best practice is I don't care if you're a million or 30. You can implement them and they work. Um, mm -hmm. But the diversity sometimes is actually an, an advantage because we have different perspectives and can kind of knock each other in the head in the right direction when we need to. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and the final question, it's uh, fairly similar about group fit. Um, someone says, being a specialty store, I am wondering if I could glean enough to make it worth it. Well. This is open to the industry, and there's basically appliance stores, mattress stores, furniture stores, special order stores, high end, low end, medium, and everything in between. And uh, I think we cover the gamut. Um, you can glean enough out of it if you want to. That's basically my answer. But I'll turn it over to uh, Paul and uh, Brian. Yeah, I don't know that it makes a lot of difference. I mean, we have uh, we have members that are high-end furniture that are very design-oriented. Um, we are a mid-priced. Uh, we sell you know mid-priced sofas. Uh, we never do any in-home selling. We sell washing machines. You know, it's a very different kind of business from that perspective. Uh, but kind of like you say, similar to the last point. The, the, business, the business challenges we face are so incredibly simple, um, it, it's, uh, or excuse me, similar, that we all work on them together anyway. Uh, the, the product we're selling, I mean, honestly, we use we washers and, and uh, sofas, and you could be selling something completely different. As long as we're all retailers, I think we can help each other a lot. So those, uh, those don't make much of a difference, I don't think. Yeah, I would, I, I, not really much to add to that. I would agree. If, 
if you go to these meetings with an open mind and you go to these meetings understanding that you don't know everything and you want to learn, um, there there is absolutely no possible way that you could not pay for the meeting with with the idea or ideas that you're going to get. I mean, even you know when when I first joined groups uh, and kind of how Paul and I group and it is that was during tough economic times and the first meeting we had I think eight members and by the second meeting five members had dropped off because financially they didn't they didn't want to make the trip anymore and then all of a sudden Paul had a few members drop off so we combined the groups and now we have I think a power group and um, even when we had one meeting where I think it was maybe three or four retailers now I still had a page full of ideas and three or four that I implemented from that meeting that uh, that we still use today and, and have, have led to our success. So it is, I think it is literally impossible to get a group of, of retailers that want to get better, put them in a room together. There's no way you are not going to see positive gains from that. Okay, so that's it for our questions today. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Kevin, uh, Paul, and Brian for joining. Um, Kevin, do you have anything else you'd wish to uh, say? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to thank everyone for attending. Um, I think it's been a, a great webinar, and um, I'll be following up with each of you personally to answer any additional questions that you may have. Um, and of course, feel free to contact David anytime. Um, so if there's no other questions, um, that concludes our webinar. Thank you. Great, great to talk with you guys. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.